Good morning and welcome to Begin in the Word. Today we're starting a series of studies on the seven churches of Asia, and in particular the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. I'm very excited to start this study with you and to share the things that God's Word teaches us from this great book. Let's turn our attention now to the opening passage in the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 1. Here the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Here he introduces us to the book's title or name. We typically call this the book of Revelation. The formal name of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Very often when you talk about the book of Revelation, people think of it as a book about the end of time or about the second coming of Christ. And the term that's translated revelation can have reference to the second coming, but it means so much more. I'd like for us to look at that for just a moment now. The term that is translated revelation means to uncover or to unveil. It literally means a revealing of Jesus Christ. So think of it in these terms. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, or the book of Revelation, is a book that reveals Jesus to us. And as we read the book and learn about its truth, we learn more about Jesus Christ. Now, let's think about the different ways that this term is used in the New Testament. Romans 16, 25, Ephesians 3 and verse 3, the term is used related to revealing something that had been hidden like a mystery or something, not that it was confusing or mysterious in that sense, but it had been hidden and then it was now revealed. So it's about a revealing of something that had been hidden. Sometimes the, the term is used with regard to giving insight into a certain truth, such as in Ephesians 1 and verse 17, revealing something or explaining something. And sometimes it's used in reference to the second coming of Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, 1 Peter 1 and 7, talking about Christ being revealed at his second coming. So with these things in mind, let's think of this book title as informing our view of the book. We're going to look at the book to learn more about Jesus, to see it as a revealing of Jesus. Now, is the message of the book of Revelation exclusively about the second coming of Christ and events leading up to the second coming? But to be sure, I know a lot of people see the book that way, but I'd like to offer you an alternative point of view. And that alternative point of view comes right from this first verse in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1. He said, these are things which must shortly take place. Well, let's think about the significance of this. This is a time stamp that the Lord puts on the book of Revelation. And he said, as he explained this to the apostle John, these are things that must shortly take place. Well, what does that mean, shortly take place? Well, the word that is translated shortly here indicates quickness or speed. Now, the Lord is talking to John about the way John and his audience would perceive the speed of the events that are foretold in this book. As you study the book of Revelation, you'll see there are segments of the book that are the narrative description of what's going on and what uh, leading up to moments where John sees a vision. And then there are sections in the book that are actually visions or prophecies that John sees, and they have some meaning attached to them. And so these events that are foretold would happen with a certain perceived speed from John's perspective. And the Lord explains to him that from John's perspective, that would shortly take place. Take place here denotes a complete fulfillment of events. As I study this passage, I'm made to wonder, well, is he saying it would shortly start to be fulfilled? That might seem like it would make sense, but that's not what the term it's translated take place means it doesn't mean that it's going to shortly start. It means there's a completion to it. Well, let's think about how that would affect our understanding of the book. And consider not only does the Lord open the book of Revelation with this phrase, these are things that must shortly take place. He closes the book with the same phrase, Revelation 22 and verse 6. So as we have a book that reveals Jesus to us, the Lord tells us this book 
is about things that must shortly take place. And he opens the book with that word and he closes the book with that word. What should I get from that? How should I understand that? But that this is something that would happen somehow near to the time of John's life. Let's look a little more closely at the issue. I hear a lot of people say that, well, in 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, the Lord said that a day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as with a day. So with the Lord, time is a, is a relative thing, that a, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And that language is used to excuse basically saying short, shortly take place here doesn't mean that it was going to happen near John's time. That it was actually going to happen far distant to John's time. Well, there's no question that time is a relative thing to God, that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. But that does not mean that we should disregard what the Lord says about time. When the Lord attaches a time event, uh, element to a certain uh, message that he's given us, we shouldn't just say, well, time's relative to God, so I'm going to disregard that. Uh, think about the the passage in Acts 22 and verse 18, where the same word is used. This is Paul talking about the Lord communicating with him after his conversion. It says, and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now, the Lord told Paul to get out of Jerusalem quickly. That's the same word that's translated shortly in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, and also in Revelation 22 in verse 6. So what's Paul supposed to do with these instructions from the Lord? Is he supposed to say, well, time's relative to God, and a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, so I'm going to take my time and stay in Jerusalem as long as I want. Well, of course Paul's not to understand it that way. The Lord was talking to Paul not about how the Lord perceived time, but about how Paul perceived time just like the Lord is talking to John about how John perceived time. And he's saying these things will shortly take place. Now, does that mean that literally everything in the book is exclusively about things near to John's time? Well, let's look at it this way. Let's consider these things on a timeline. Let's think about the view that sees the book of Revelation as a book that talks about events leading up to the end of time events that were far distant to John's future and the future of the immediate audience to whom he was writing. What that view says is that the word short here doesn't really mean short. It really means it's going to be a long time before these things happen. So you have John's life and you have a long time passing before any of these things are fulfilled in the events that lead up to the second coming of Christ. Now, in all fairness, is that being honest with how Jesus opened? and closed this book when he twice told us at the beginning and the end these things will shortly take place to just completely ignore that and say, oh no, this looks far to John's future at things that were long in his future. Let me offer this alternative view that short really does mean short. And it's not that there's nothing in the book that speaks to the end of time, but it's looking at John's life and events that would happen near to John's lifetime, particularly events relating to tribulation that John and the churches were facing. We'll talk about this as we continue in our studies. And it looks at those events with a view to looking forward to our eternal and heavenly hope. So you may have concepts or elements in the book that speak to eternity. But the main message of the book speaks to events that were near John's lifetime, particularly to the church's struggle against persecutions brought by the hands of the Roman Empire. Now let's look at another important clue about the way we understand the book that we find here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Here he says that he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So the message involves uh, words that are signified or uh, a message from the Lord to John to the churches that is signified. And that word that's translated signified means a sign. It can indicate symbolic language. And so the term is appropriate to the symbolic character of the book. 
Now, there are some people who insist on interpreting all the elements of the book of Revelation very literally. However, even people that insist upon that will talk about different symbols in the book meaning different things other than what they literally say. The truth is the book of Revelation in hundreds of instances draws upon the rich, the rich language of Old Testament prophecy and uses Old Testament prophetic verbiage to construct a picture that reveals Jesus to us through the story of the church, of John's day, suffering at the hands of the Romans. And the idea that it's signified here is the Lord saying, I'm using symbolic language to a certain extent to get this message across. That word that's translated signified is used in John 12, verse 32 and 33, where foretelling the Lord's crucifixion, he said that the Son of Man would be lifted up. Well, if we insisted on taking that literally, we would say somewhere along the way, someone's going to take Jesus and pick him up and lift him up higher, you see. And obviously that's not what he's saying. He doesn't use the word crucified, but he signifies the idea in the sig symbolic language of saying he's going to be lifted up. And the text tells us by that he meant he's going to be crucified. So sometimes the Lord describes things in symbolic language. And when we see the poetic language that's often employed in the prophets of the Old Testament and in the book of Le Revelation, we can understand that some of this is a signifying language or it's symbolic language that with rich terminology paints a picture of things that were short to John's future. I want you to notice a promise he gives in Revelation 1 verse 3 where he said, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Again, he assures us that these are things that would be within a near scope of John's life, but he promises a blessing to anybody who reads this. And by reading, that would be someone who would hear the words of the prophecy. Not only would they hear, but they would keep it. So even though these were things that were would happen near to John's time, with a view to the eternal promises that give us hope in the face of persecutions and tribulations, these are things that speak to all Christians of all ages. And he promises we'll all be blessed if we hear and obey the message of the book. So John apparently expected the congregations there at Asia to publicly read the book and to make copies and share with other Christians. And that should not surprise us because other books in the New Testament were copied and shared. We read in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 27 about that letter being read to the church. We read similar ideas in Colossians 4 and 16 about New Testament letters being copied and shared with other congregations. The idea is that the letters that were written to these individual congregations were shared with other churches because though they speak to Christians in those settings, they really speak to Christians of all ages. And a blessing comes to those who hear God's word and obey it. Luke eleven twenty eight, James 1, 21 through 25 specifically teaches us there. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer. We'll be blessed, friends, if we carefully study the message of the revelation of Jesus Christ and look for principles that we can obey. And that's exactly what we're setting out to do here at Beginning the Word. Thank you so much for joining us for today's study. And as we've begun today in the Word, I pray that you'll live out today and every day in the Word of God.